Hi there, my name is Bryn Roach and today I want to talk to you about the importance of chiral crystallization strategies and how APC approach problems in this area, in particular dealing with chiral purity and yield. So first of all, I'll just give a brief overview of today's talk before I start. Firstly, um, I'll just talk about the background of chirality, stereoisomers and their importance in uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients followed by an introduction to ternary phase diagrams and why they're so important to the correct design of enantioselective crystallizations. After that, I'll present some case studies that we have carried out. So case study one is ternary phase diagrams as a tool for process definition. And case study two will be the application of ternary phase diagrams in diastereomeric salt isolation. For both cases, I'll discuss the problems posed, how we tackle them, and then some brief conclusions. So just first of all, just to talk about APC and our partners. Um, so I'm just presenting a summary of APC and our commercial partners. It's, uh, we are a contract research organization based in Dublin. We employ over 200 scientists and engineers working across um, a broad range of areas from small to large molecule. Um, we collaborate with biopharmaceutical and pharmaceutical companies uh, across the globe uh, to accelerate the delivery of medicines to market and we do this all through our data rich process development ethos. So at APC we offer value through the synergistic relationship of our chemistry, biologically, biological and uh, engineering departments. This allows for rapid process definition, feasibility, characterization and development studies. So first of all, just a background. So prior to discussing any of the case studies I've mentioned earlier, I'm going to do a brief recap of chirality in active pharmaceutical ingredients. And we'll just go over that first. So with altered chirality can come altered physiological and pharmacological effects. For example, the stereoisomers of the APIs that I've shown just below are beneficial treatments for nausea, arthritis, and tuberculosis. Unfortunately, their chiral analogues cause disastrous effects, such as blindness, toxicity, and uh, tetragenic fetal abnormalities. So, uh, so that in particular, that's a thalidomide case. So I'll just show some, a brief glossary uh, of key terms that are important and that will be noted throughout this webinar. So chirality, it's a geometric property of a molecule. Um, a chiral compound is a non-superimposable uh, with its mirror image. Enantiomers are chiral compounds that are non-superimposable non mirror images. Diastereomers are chiral compounds that are not mirror images of one another and are non-superimposable. Enantiomeric pairs have identical physical properties but diastereomers will have differing physical properties, which will come into play when I talk about the second case study. This difference can be observed in the solubility design space and our solid phase characterization. So the solid phase. So when we are talking about the solid phase characterization, uh, this is a key step in the design of an enantioselective crystallization. This can help us understand the arrangement of the crystal lattice and if our enantiomers crystallize as a racemic conglomerate or a solid solution. So a conglomerate crystal lattice arrangement is desirable. This solid phase characterization can be achieved using binary phase diagrams or ternary phase diagrams as shown below. So during the binary phase diagram characterization, we use DSC to monitor the melting points of the solid mixtures of our chiral compounds. And then during the ternary phase diagram construction, we assess the solubility of solid mixtures and plot this on our ternary phase diagram, where the eutectic point is the highest solubility point of that mixture. Now, due to enantiomers having identical physical properties, we would expect enantiomers to have a symmetrical diagram while if we're looking at a diastereomeric system 
we would have potentially one-sided system or a, a non-symmetrical system. But you'll see examples of this in case study one and case study two in a moment. So on the bottom row here, you can just see an example of some ternary phase diagrams. But as I said, we'll discuss these in further detail when we move on to the case studies. So in our first case study, I'll talk about ternary phase diagrams as a tool for process development. In the process flow diagram shown below, a hydrogenation reaction and a subsequent purification is described. A number of charcoal treatments, reslurries, distillations and hot filtrations were carried out before final isolation of the API. This would be considered a lab scale time intensive process. One of the obvious areas for improvement on this process was time, taking an average of one week to go from reaction to isolated product. Beyond the process time, some of the key outputs were inconsistent, such as EE, yield, solid assay, and a large variability in the heavy metal purging. APC were tasked with measuring solubility and the effect that residual heavy metals may have on the conglomerate system. Solubility was collected and an antioselective crystallization was developed and optimized so we could isolate the desired enantiomer. After this, the optimized process was scaled up to 10 grams and subsequently 100 grams to demonstrate the process robustness. So key to all projects here in APC is the process establishment phase. This allows us to understand the key quality attributes associated with each process. To gain a better understanding of the process, APC employs a data-rich experimentation ethos. This allows us to gain key information for each unit operation so we can assess their efficiency with regard to assay, impurity, yield loss, and in this case, heavy metal traces. For each reslurry and charcoal treatment, the assay and chiral purity increased. When we tracked the heavy metal content throughout, it was noted that neither of the charcoal treatments were beneficial for purging these impurities. The water and IPA reslurries were shown to be a lot more effective in this regard. And this signaled early on in the project that charcoal treatments were ineffective and could potentially be removed from this process. Mass balance assessment of each unit operation was carried out as part of the process assessment. For this, each process rich and waste stream was analysed by HPLC. Shown below, about 10 mg per gram per API is lost for each reslurry that we carry out. When this is assessed by normal phase HPLC, we see that there is a 50-50 mixture of the desired and undesired enantiomer lost to the liquor. This highlights the important learning that properly selecting your HPLC method for solubility can affect your process. And this is also a common development pitfall. At APC, we use an in-house platform for early phase solvent selection, solubility assessment and crystallization design. We leverage the use of in silico computational screening to predict their solubility and give the relative solvate propensity and impurity purging. This allows us to screen a variety of solvents, solvent classes, and carry forward a short list of desirable solvents for experimental validation through two point solubility. From there, small scale crystallizations will be carried out. By doing this, we can maximize the amount of information that we gain on the potential solvent system. So shown below is data from one such computational screen. In this case, we used both Cosmo, RS and Dynagem. So below 27 potential solvents were assessed. We ranked them by relative solubility of our desired enantiomeric compound. This helps us identify good solvents. In this case, you can see DMF and DMSO, or potential anti-solvents. So in this case, water or alkanes. As we didn't desire a solvate, the graph on the right-hand side shows solvents with a high propensity to form a solvate. 
and this is one of the tools we use to help us narrow down the list of potential solvents. For example, if you look here, you can see THF of formic acid removed from any subsequent experimental screen due to their solvate forming propensity. So to build the ternary phase diagram, we generally conduct solubility. Two common methods employed at APC are isothermal solubility and clearing cloud points through crystal 16. The isothermal method is generally paired with HPLC sampling. To carry out the isothermal solubility, we need to synthesize the opposite enantiomer of the API that we desire. In this case, we did it by modifying the catalyst system we used. To measure solubility, we add an excess of solids to a known volume of our chosen solvent. We allow this to equilibrate and sample the liquor by chiral HPLC. We calculate the concentration in milligrams per gram of each enantiomer in the liquid. We then convert this to weight percent and plot it on our ternary phase diagram. You can see a representative ternary phase diagram in the bottom right hand corner. So as this is an antiomeric system, as we predict, we would see a simple eutectic point at a 50-50 mixture. In the second case study, I'll present a system of diastereomers, which will show an unsymmetrical ternary phase diagram. To verify a simple eutectic system, we can carry out one simple experiment. Saturated samples of our desired and undesired enantiomers are individually prepared and their isothermal solubility is checked by HPLC. From there, we add an excess of the opposite enantiomer to each liquor and allow it to equilibrate and sample once again by HPLC. After equilibration, in isothermal conditions, a simple eutectic system should converge at the same eutectic point regardless of the starting enantiomeric enantiomer provided, if both enantiomers are in excess. This was the case as shown in figure B, confirming that a simple eutectic system was at play. At this point in our development journey, we possessed a keen understanding of the solubility of our material and how to construct the solubility design space. Another key objective was to understand if the residual heavy metal impurities affected the solubility of the API. To do this, we isolated solids throughout the process and assessed them by chiral HPLC. Solubility of the pure materials and the crude materials at the midpoint had a similar solubility. The crude reaction output solubility was also collected. Again, even with high levels of rhodium, zinc and iron, it possessed a similar level of solubility. So when we plot this on our ternary phase diagram, it agrees with previously collected solubility. While it was theorized that heavy metal content could have a, a very large impact, it highlights the importance of collecting efficient solubility data. Using our ternary phase diagrams, a potential process roadmap can be constructed. As a proof of concept, a crystallization was executed starting with 70 to 30 weight percent desired to undesired enantiomer in a 50 50 IBA to water mixture. As with all process development in APC, we utilize inline PAT with our data rich experimentation approach. In this scenario, we utilized FTIR and FBRM to track our seeded crystallization. After effective seeding and dissolution, we observed desaturation as indicated by 0.4. During our cooling to our isolation temperature, we observe a secondary nucleation event by FBRM and FTIR. We also tracked this experiment by HVLC for the Mudwicker and solids. Here we can see an initial desaturation and that yields our desired enantiomer, with the undesired enantiomer remaining largely in solution. We do, however, see a secondary nucleation at 30 degrees, and we see desaturation of both enantiomers. 
that is transferred to our ternary phase diagram, we can track our process from seeding to desaturation to secondary nucleation as we cross the phase boundary where we build a supersaturation of our undesired enantomer and to our isolation point at our eutectic composition. Our first case study, we employed a ternary phase diagram as a key tool in the development of a chiral crystallization. It enabled the development of a scalable, shorter, and more robust process, where the unnecessary carbon treatments, drying, and distillation steps were removed effectively. The resulting process gave us an improved yield, enantiomeric purity, assay, and better heavy metal purging. In our second case study, I'll once again show the construction of a ternary phase diagram, but I will show how they can be used to isolate diastereomeric salts and how the system could be used to construct a semi-continuous process. A diastereomeric salt is synthesized by reacting a racemic acidic or basic compound with an enantiopure acidic or basic resolving agent. These can be separated by fractional crystallization and once isolated, the salts can be neutralized to then give the pure enantiomer. As highlighted at the start of the webinar, diastereomers, and in this case diastereomeric salts, tend to have interesting properties which can be leveraged when designing a crystallization. They can have high solubility differences, so your choice of solvent and resolving agent can be key. The morphology of the diastereomeric crystals can be distinct also. They can have varied thermal stability and a crystallization behavior. Lanzoprazole is one such example of an API that have used diastereomeric salt isolation during their development. We are talking about ibuprofen and lysine as our salt pair. The desired diastereomeric salt, in this case, will be referred to as the N salt, while the undesired diastereomer will be referred to as the P salt. First, we characterize our salts by HVLC, XRD, and DSC. Then, in an analogous manner in the first case study, we conduct thermodynamic solubility of the pure diastereomeric salts by HVLC. Following that, we conduct solubility of the solid mixtures of the P and N salts. Then we use crystal 16 to gain clear and cloud points and this allows us to define the metastable zone width of our salts which is highly important when designing our crystallization. The collected solubility of the salts were presented as weight percent in this case and we add them to our ternary phase diagram which is shown on the bottom right hand corner. So as you can see, the eutectic point is observed at 34 to 66 weight percent of the NE salt. And this is something I mentioned before, that diastereomers wouldn't have a simple eutectic point of 50-50, as enantiomers do. If you look at the left, you can see the solubility and the cloud points of each salt, and that allows us to define the metal stable zone width. In this case, as you can see, the P salt has a much higher solubility and a greater temperature dependence with its solubility. This is indicative that a cooling system for our crystallization would suit for the isolation of the P salt. Down below on the ternary phase diagram is the method we have devised for isolating both of the diastereomeric salts. If you start at point one, we have an equal mixture of the P salt and the N salt at 30 degrees Celsius. This feed is then added to an N-seeded isothermal vessel, which crystallizes our N-salt in high purity, leaving us with a P-salt enriched liquor. This liquor is then seeded with P-salt and a cooling crystallization is conducted to 20 degrees Celsius. This allows us to isolate high purity P-salt. The resulting mother liquor is slightly enriched with the P salt. So it's mixed with an N enriched feed at 0.4, which allows us to return to our starting composition. So to conclude,
conclude our second case study, we have shown how we can build a ternary phase diagram and use our solubility studies to facilitate the separation of diastereomeric salts in high purity and efficiency. A simple eutectic point at 34 to 66 weight percent end salt P salt was observed. This is something which is characteristic of systems for diastereomers. Also of note is the schematic on the right hand side which shows how amenable this process would be to a semi-continuous system. If you'd like more information on this specific case study, please have a look at the paper below. And finally, I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening to my webinar. And if you have any questions or comments, um, please let me know. I look forward to discussing it with you further.